are listening to Fragments of History, a podcast series that looks at different events and people in the life of St. Josemaria and the history of Opus Dei. Luis Cano works at the St. Josemaria Escriva de Balaguer Historical Institute in Rome. At the end of 2020, He published a critical study of four unpublished letters that the founder wrote to members of Opus Dei, past, present, and future. This is a translated adaptation of an interview that he gave on this volume of work. The founder of Opus Dei, St. Josemaria, wrote many things throughout his life. Books, letters, instructions, personal notes. Some of his works were published during his lifetime, such as The Way or Holy Rosary. But most of them are unpublished and are kept in the general archives of the prelature. In 2001, the then prelate of Opus Dei, Javier Echevarria, set up the St. Josemaria Escriva de Belaguer Historical Institute, which has its headquarters in Rome and Pamplona, so that a team of historians could assume responsibility for these documents and study and publish it. An important part of this archive are the letters that the founder wrote to the members of Opus Dei, but they may be of interest to many more people. The first four were published for the first time a few months ago, This book consists of four long letters addressed to Opus Dei members of all times. They are texts, from the most part, that have been used quite a lot within Opus Dei, partially for the most part, and until now there has not been a complete edition for the general public and neither in a critical format. They are part of a set of 43 letters that still remain unpublished and which he organized by putting dates on them, and we have begun by editing the first four. Although St. Josemaria wanted to publish these letters definitively, he was not able to in his lifetime because he didn't have time, and he died before finishing that edition. At the end of his life, he was still revising them until shortly before he died because he wanted to correct some mistakes. There was a delay in the publication because it became clear that the best thing to do was to wait for an instrument, an institute, which could carry out these editions in a critical manner. A critical edition involves checking the manuscripts that exist, if there are any small differences, etc. This led to the creation of the Institute, which began by doing this kind of critical editions for the books that had already been published, and then, little by little, we started to work on unpublished books. The first thing was to define who could take on this work, the methodology to be followed, what to start with, etc., Some insisted that it was better to start by publishing the unpublished meditations. In fact, a few years ago, Frances Castells and I published a book on St. Josemaria's unpublished meditations. Others thought that the letters were the best thing to do, and in the end, we began the letters. We have studied them in depth. It's been a bit slow, but now I think we're working at a good pace, and we'll go even faster with the next ones. Another reason for the delay in publication was that, for a long time, it was thought that all this material was only of interest to people belonging to Opus Dei. This is partly true, but, in my opinion, there are texts that can be inspiring for many people, Christians, obviously, and even in some aspects for non-Christians. Paul VI himself, when St. Josemaria died, told his successor that all these unpublished texts were a treasure for the Church. This has encouraged us to present them and to overcome the slight embarrassment that may be involved in publishing this content. As editor of this book, I had to first of all go through the original manuscripts and some printed versions of each letter to make sure that the texts are exactly as St. Josemaria wanted them to be. While working on this, we learned that he had corrected them many times usually very small corrections, but he hadn't unified them into a single document. There were several. We have been studying them to find out which was the latest version and even to recover some things that were in an earlier version, but which he had forgotten to add at the end. 
It's a bit of a mess, but that's the first task, to check everything to make sure that we are offering the text he wanted. Then he added a short introduction to each letter, brief notes where I thought readers might appreciate it, especially for those who are not familiar with St. Josemaria. We have also looked for the origin of some of the quotations he mentions from memory, some sayings, as well as the biblical quotations which we have revised very thoroughly. Then there is a general introduction to the whole set of these letters by Don José Luis Illanes, and another one in which the whole history of the manuscripts and the document itself is explained. St. Josemaria says precisely these letters are not necessary for you. They are not necessary. Everything that is Opus Dei, you already know. You do it well. This is a summary so that it can be useful in a century's time. If someone has not known him or has not heard him, there is a very familial tone to these letters. It is nothing like a treatise. It's more like a conversation. It changes from one subject to another, tells a joke. When you read them, it is easy to imagine that you have the founder in front of you. That is the function they have. It is not a do what I say here to the letter. But he says verbatim, this is a family conversation. The first letter is a relatively short piece of writing. It is 19 pages long in the critical edition. In it, he explains the essential features of Christian life today. For example, he begins the letter by saying, The Lord has his eyes and his heart on the crowd, on all the nations. We too, like Jesus, must always face the crowd. For there is no human creature that we do not love, that we do not try to help and understand. We are interested in everyone. In other words, he says that God calls Christians today, but especially the members of Opus Dei, its cooperators and friends and supporters, to take care of everyone, not to have a mentality of taking refuge in a ghetto, of protecting oneself, of going to a kind of chic hotel or an exclusive club, where one can dedicate oneself to being goody-goodies and living in safety. Rather, he says that it is necessary to go out to meet a multitude who, today, especially in the West and especially among young people, are turning away from God. In fact, he is quite insistent on this message. This is the great apostolate of the work, to show the multitude that awaits us, which is the path that leads straight to God. That does not mean indoctrinating people or brainwashing them. He talks a lot about it being a service, the best service we can give to a person who is close to us and whom we love. He says a phrase that I find very meaningful. Understand everyone in order to serve everyone. In order to serve, one must understand. And in order to understand, one must listen. He will talk a lot about this in the fourth letter. The first letter sums up his whole thought, his whole spirit, even though it is so brief. Then he develops these things further. For example, in number 22, he says this sentence, we must fill the world with light. Naturally, he will explain later that it is not to turn the world into a sacristy, but to fill it with light. Not our light, which is rather weak, but the light that Christ gives you, which enables you to see the reality of things and their beauty, their truth. That means illuminating all professions, art, sport, music, social networks, internet. You carry a light that somehow transforms makes what you are doing more beautiful. And of course, to have that light, you have to plug in the battery. He talks a lot about how we charge ourselves, so to speak metaphorically, with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not with an idea or an ideology, but with a person. He says specifically, the Lord is constantly speaking to us in a thousand everyday details. Even though it could seem that the second letter places an emphasis on humility, in actual fact, all the letters do not have just one theme, because St. Josemaria is not a systematic author. He himself says in letter number 15, My letters are not a treatise. In this letter he mixes a lot of things with other virtues such as faithfulness, the ability to get up after a fall, the simplicity to ask for advice and help from a person who loves us when there is something inside us that oppresses us. He also talks a lot about the failures, 
the falls, the sins that we experience every day. He says, for example, that in our spiritual struggle, there will be no lack of failures. But in the face of this, in the face of our mistakes, in the face of error, we must react immediately by making an act of contrition. In other words, when we realize our misery, it is no use burying our heads in the ground like an ostrich or torturing ourselves with feelings of guilt. He says, we ask God's forgiveness and then we start again. This is a large part of the content of this letter. Hence he also says, for example, that you have to see the positive side of things. What seems most terrible in life is not so black, not so dark. If you point it out, you will not come to pessimistic conclusions. It is a vision that comes from trust in God, not from positive thinking. In other words, one is like a bottle of luxury perfume, where one carries something that is not one's own and that is precious. When you feel empty, then what you have to do is to ask God to fill it in order to be able to give it to others. In this way, he explains that humility becomes the necessary condition to be useful in order to have a fruitful life. In fact, it seems to me that this letter revolves around the commentary on that phrase of St. Paul, When I am weak, then I am strong. Humility is a virtue that helps us to be united to Jesus, so as not to lose that connection I was talking about before. That is why he says, We are in love and we live in love. We continually set our hearts on Jesus Christ our Lord. This is, as I said at the beginning, one of those leitmotifs that Escriva repeats. It is his way of understanding the Christian life, being very close to Jesus Christ, of having a deep friendship with him, of being simple with him, and this constant awareness, as he said, of being forgiven and understood by God, loved by God. In spite of our failures and how badly we sometimes behave, he continually talks about the fact that you may have fallen a thousand times, but God does not love you because you have behaved well. He loves you because you are his son or daughter and because he loves you. Not because you are a genius and a saint, but just because you are who you are. And that fills you with that love that he says is the engine of everything, that makes you faithful to God and in living the Christian life. The third letter is long and very rich in content, and I was pleasantly surprised when I read it in 2019, when I started working on it. What it raises is what the Christian should do in the world, what his mission is. Should I impose my truth on others because it is a truth that saves? Should I make a concrete political choice to support that program? Do these Christian values have to illuminate public life, or are they a private thing? The first thing I would say about this letter is that this letter is a hymn to Christian freedom and responsibility. For example, it says, We come to sanctify every honest human labor with ordinary work, precisely in the world, in a lay and secular way, in the service of the Holy Church, of the Roman Pontiff, and of all souls. To achieve this, we must defend freedom. I think this is something quite original. At the same time, it is also a letter that is a hymn to work. For example, it says that we must love every kind of human work because work is the means for the sanctification of souls and for the glory of God. He assures that in the midst of that honest work, every woman, every man can hear that call of Christ, that personal call, which communicates a sense of mission in work that ennobles and gives value to our existence. Because Jesus enters with authority into the soul, into yours, into mine. That is the call. It seems to me that this is quite current too. It can also be the lack of work, obviously. He says that the call of Jesus Christ does not change your life, but it gives you a new vision of it. It is as if a light is turned on inside us that moves us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ in all fields of human activity. He strongly encourages service to others through all professions. He explains, for example, that a loyal and disinterested presence in the field of public life offers immense possibilities for doing good. In fact, he talks a lot and gives advice on how to live honestly if one has to occupy a position of authority, be it in a private company or in the public sphere. 
These are very interesting criteria for a Christian who realistically lives his life in the middle of the world. At the same time, he makes it very clear that Opus Dei has no politics whatsoever that is not its purpose. Our only purpose is spiritual and apostolic. That is why the work of God has not entered and will never enter into the political struggle of the parties. It is also interesting to hear this from the founder, who had no idea of political maneuvering, even if it was to transmit very good and Christian values. Rather, one tries, through one's light, to illuminate the things one does, to give them the color of one's own faith, but not to try to impose or maneuver. All this is framed in a spirit of understanding and openness. In fact, at the end of this letter, he says something that surprised me because it is so blunt. This way of behaving, acting with understanding and openness, is of the very essence of the work. For the Lord wants us on all the roads of the earth, sowing the seeds of understanding, apology, forgiveness, charity, peace. We will never feel that we are enemies of anyone. The work will never discriminate. It will never wish to exclude anyone from its apostolate. Otherwise, it would be a betrayal of its own purpose. And that is the end of the letter. I wondered about the relevance of the fourth letter that speaks of evangelization, since the context in which St. Josemaria wrote is nothing like today, at least in the countries with a Christian tradition. But it is quite relevant today. I think this letter is a continuation of the previous one. It's my own idea, but I have the feeling that the previous letter was too long, and he decided to cut a piece and make another shorter letter, because this one is relatively short. In the letter, he develops precisely these ideas, to understand everyone in order to serve everyone, and to become closer and not to be afraid. And this includes people who think in the opposite way to you in religious matters. In the first paragraph, he says that Opus Dei has a particular way of teaching the gospel. This particular way moves us to understanding, to apology, to delicate charity towards all souls. In other words, evil exists, but he thinks that a Christian, a person of Opus Dei, must drown evil in an abundance of good. This phrase has been quoted many times, and it is in this letter that it appears. At the same time, he also says that fidelity to the truth, doctrinal coherence, and the defense of the faith do not signify a sad spirit, nor must they be animated by a desire to annihilate those who err. He has several sentences dedicated to people who allow themselves to be carried away by anger, fanaticism, or exaggeration, and who turn their life into a perpetual crusade because what he wants to emphasize is precisely the opposite, that this understanding must be lived. And he continues, It is also necessary that you listen, that you be ready to enter into a frank and cordial dialogue with the souls you wish to bring closer to God. That is to say, not to impose an ideology or ideas on others, but to serve them, and to serve them, to understand them, and to understand them, to listen to them. Also, in the middle of this letter, he says that, to bring the truth to others, the procedure is to pray, to understand, to dialogue with each other, and then to make them think and help them to study things. And then, at the end of the letter, he repeats it again in a rather strict way. This is our spirit, and we will always show it by opening the doors of our houses to people of all ideologies and all social conditions, without distinction with our hearts and arms ready to welcome everyone. It is not our mission to judge, but our duty to treat all people as brothers and sisters. There is not a soul we exclude from our friendship. In regards to reading this book, perhaps the best thing to do is to start by reading the text directly, and if you have questions, to go backwards. The introduction is a bit long, and it might not say anything to a person who is interested in reading the texts, because many of the notes have to do with the dates when it was composed, when it was written, the problem of a manuscript that arose in the printing process, things that most people are not interested in. The critical edition is aimed at specialists, 
at people who perhaps want to do a theological study, for example, and then they would want to know if a certain phrase was said exactly like that or not, if he changed it. That's what the critical edition is for, to give the certainty that this is the authentic text. But for the general public, editions are being produced that dispense with these long introductions and include very few notes. And at the end, there is a glossary with some technical terms, in case you don't know them. But I think the text is quite easy to understand, because Sinhas Maria's way of speaking and writing was very simple. <laughs> 